imagine that right now you're feeling a bit like Alice, tumbling down the rabbit hole? Hmm? Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life, that there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill, the story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. All I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. Well, we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of election, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. But I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people. And now, welcome to another episode of Down the Rabbit Hole. Here's your host from FederalJack.com. It's Popeye. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to tonight's live edition. It is May 2nd, 2013. And I have a ton of things that I want to get into tonight. First and foremost, yes, I will be taking two hosts from MSNBC to the woodshed tonight. But there's two other things that I need to squeeze in. So... They will be put on the back burner until I get the other two things squeezed in, but we'll have enough time to do all of it. The other two are really quick. First and foremost, and I haven't posted this on federaljack.com yet, but you can go read it over at the Daily Courant, or Courant, however you pronounce it. Bloomberg refused second slice of pizza at local restaurant. I have to get this out there right before I even do anything else, say anything else. I'm, gonna, I, I'm not going to have enough time in the whole first segment here to get into it, so I'll read it on the other side. But i got to give this guy a shout-out. The, the owner of this pizzeria, it's uh, Coleño's Pizzeria. Uh, that's, they don't really give too much other information on it, but uh, it's spelled C-O-L-L-E-G-N-O apostrophe S. Pizzeria. Look this guy up, and if you're in the area in New York, wherever this guy's pizzeria is, go in there and buy a pizza from this guy just for because of what he did. Okay, I'm going to tell you on the other side, but you really need to support this guy because he's got a brass set that wouldn't fit in a dump truck. Just wait till you hear what he did to Bloomberg. Poetic justice to somebody that wants to control everything about you. And this is what we need to do. When these petty tyrants come in, if you're an owner and they come into your establishment, you need to handle them just like this guy did. Again, go over and support this guy's pizzeria. I uh, just epic, epic, epic what he did. And I'm going to make you wait till the other side of the break because I want to read you the whole exchange between the two. <laughs> All I can say is, ha 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 ha, Mike. <laughs> People are tired of this crap. People just want to be free and be left alone and stop being told what to do all the time by people who think they know better. Well, just wait. (laughs) We'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back, and I have a bit of a nice long segment here to get into this. Okay, now there's there's something else I'll get into, and then we'll, we'll get into tearing apart MSNBC. But first... Bloomberg refused second slice of pizza at a local restaurant. And I'm going to try to get through this without laughing hysterically because I, I <laughs> when I first read this, I was literally laughing out loud in my office. 
Um, here we go. New York Mayor Mike Bloomberg was denied a second slice of pizza today at an Italian eatery in Brooklyn. Well, there you go. Narrows it down. The guy's in Brooklyn. The owners of Caleno's Pizzeria say they refused to serve him more than one piece to protest Bloomberg's proposed soda ban, which would limit the proportions of soda sold in the city. Bloomberg was having an informal working lunch with the city comptroller, John Liu, at the time, and was enraged by the embarrassing prohibition. The owners would not relent, however, and the pair were forced to decamp to another restaurant to finish their meal. Witnesses say the situation unfolded when, as the two were looking over budget documents, they realized they needed more food than they had originally ordered. Hey, no, hold on, this is, this is Bloomberg, to the owner... Antonio Benito, quote, hey, could I get another pepperoni over here? To which the owner, Antonio ben Benito, replied, quote, I'm sorry, sir, we can't do that. You've reached your personal slice limit, end quote. Mayor Bloomberg, not accustomed to being challenged, assumed the owner was joking. Here, this is Bloomberg responding to him, quote, okay, that's funny because of the soda thing. No, come on, I'm not kidding. I haven't eaten all morning. Just send over another pepperoni, end quote. This is, <laughs> this is the owner responding. Quote, I'm sorry, sir, we're serious. We've decided that eating more than one piece isn't healthy for you, and so we're forbidding you from doing it, end quote. To which Bloomberg replied, quote, Look, jackass, I effing skipped breakfast this morning just so I could eat four slices of your pizza, don't be a schmuck. Just get back to the kitchen and bring out some effing pizza, okay? End quote. To which the owner replied, quote, I'm sorry, sir. There's nothing I can do. Maybe you could go to several restaurants and get one slice at each. At least that way you're walking. You know, burning calories. End quote. <laughs> oh, God. That's, see, that's the way you handle these people. You, you don't treat them like they're gods. You don't treat them, put them up on some sort of pedestal. You treat them just like you'd treat any other idiot who's overstepping his boundaries. Go get me some effing pizza. Right. Right. You're lucky you're the mayor. That's all I got to say. If you were some average Joe, I'll bet you the guy would have thrown him out on his face. Witnesses say a fuming Bloomberg and a bemused Lou did indeed walk down the street to a rival pizzeria, ordered another slice, and finished their meeting. Well... Kudos to this guy. So go look up the name of the pizzeria again. Caleno's Pizzeria in Brooklyn. The owner's name again. Let me scroll down here. It's somewhere over here if I could find it for you guys. Of course. When I do need when I need to find the owner's name. Well, whatever, it doesn't matter. Look up Caleno's Pizzeria in Brooklyn. And when you go in there, ask for the, the owner, the guy that yelled at Bloomberg and Buy him a beer. Seriously, go buy the guy a beer or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just find it hysterically funny. That's how you deal with these scumbags. <laughs> Get out of my pizzeria. You've had your slice limit, sir. Ah, yes. So, moving on. Again, support this guy, Caleno's Pizzeria in uh, Brooklyn. Buy the guy a beer, go buy a uh, a, uh, a uh, pizza or whatever, calzone, something from the guy. Support him. Epic. Just epic. Okay, I want to get into uh, something else. Moving on, uh, recently I got the chance to hang out with a good friend, Luke Rodowski, founder of We Are Change, and uh, he hung out with... The, myself and the other guys from uh, Federal Jack. There's three of us. And uh, we got a chance to chill out, hang out, you know, uh, sit down, break some bread with them, just have a chance to talk or whatever. And Luke ended up interviewing uh, one of our, our other members, Alex, which I'm actually going to play the audio from the interview tonight. And he interviewed myself, which both interviews are over at uh, We Are Changes YouTube channel. But when he was interviewing Alex, 
uh, the Alex's story is, you know, the two interviews were completely different, but I want to air Alex's, uh, you know, if you, if you guys want to watch the one I did with him, I really don't care. You can go over to We Are Changes channel. You know, I don't like to like pat myself in the back, but Alex's interview is important for you to hear because this is something that Alex went through a couple years ago. Uh, we were uh, down on South Beach and at the time, in fact, I was still living uh, down in Miami. I don't, I no longer live down in South Dade anymore, but I, I at the time I was living on South Beach and, um, Every Memorial Day weekend, it, it's it, it. They have uh, Urban Beach Weekend, and it gets uh, it turns into a huge police state because they there's forty thousand people down there, and they get rowdy. And then their the response to it is instead of just saying no, you know what, we won't issue the permits for the parties. The city wants the money, but then they bring in the police to come in, and it gives the police excuses to act like uh, you know. Uh, stormtroopers, they come in with I mean they have ATF it, it, you'd be surprised so we've got video footage from a couple of years ago and down there, I think the last time we found a, a Homeland Security, it was Homeland Security bus or com mobile command center or whatever it was, I think it belonged to the ATF uh, You can the videos are out on the different YouTube channels, I'll have to find them and re-upload them to if, uh, if they're gone because I know we've lost so many channels, but anyway we were down uh we were down there videotaping it, and Alex got assaulted by the police, and then they, they ended up stealing his video footage, and they tried to delete it, but it didn't work. Uh, they actually failed miserably <clears throat> in their attempt to do so. And his story is quite interesting. Now, Luke uh, cut it down into about a, a six-minute audio segment, but I want you guys to hear this, because he, he did a great job interviewing Alex. And it's, the story is really, it's twisted. The cop that tackled him and beat him up, ended up uh, getting arrested for kidnapping somebody. But listen, at about a minute in, you'll hear the cop say, is that, is that federaljack.com? Is that, is that federaljack? I'm not kidding. You'll hear it. This was years ago. Okay? This is before I was even on air. This is when we were just doing uh, YouTube videos and the website, just before we even had the reach of the radio show that we do now. So this is my boy Alex, one of the founding members of federaljack.com. This is his story about getting assaulted during... Uh, martial law during Memorial Day weekend in South Beach a few years ago. Hi, this is Alex from federaljack.com and Hack Miami, and I was arrested here for filming the police. They erased my footage, but I got it back. Here's my story. So we came out here when we had read that there was going to be martial law declared uh, on Miami Beach for the Memorial Day weekend. It was in the Miami Herald and the New Times talking about how every year was worse than the last in regard to police brutality on, uh, during that time because they have a, a hip-hop festival that attracts people from all over the country who come down and they're primarily of the African-American persuasion so they, they are rather heavy-handed in their tactics. I saw the cops messing with someone and I was about 10 feet away and I took out my video camera and started filming them. And it was a bunch of cops from uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, uh, the local police departments in a multi-jurisdictional federalized task force. And they were, and well, the moment I saw the t-shirts I started filming them. And, and um, they told me to turn off my camera, which I didn't. Go, my man, you pissed me off with that fucking camera. Go ahead and turn it off. Thank you. Two officers put their hands on me. They, well, one grabbed each, uh, each side of my arm and lifted me up and carried me away. And then I was thrown over one of these concrete pillars. And, uh, and then the, the, they choked me so I couldn't say anything. And they, uh, they kept going through my flyers and paperwork to figure out who I was with. And they, they already knew I was, had been with federaljack.com. I'm being illegally searched. Once I was in custody, uh, the officers, uh, one of the officers that was uh, processing the uh, processing the detainees, um, started asking me questions, and I said I didn't have to answer any questions of hers. What kind of questions were they asking? You? Um, they, they, uh, they're asking me who I was with, uh, but there's a bunch of people from federaljack.com that I was out here with started um, coagulating outside the, the area, and I was able to communicate with them because there was a fence. 
and um, they, they asked me you know, what we, uh, who are they, what were, you know, who are we with, why were we filming. I, I just said I didn't have to talk to them. And um, she erased my, you know, she called an assistant over to help her erase the, the footage, and then put the camera, and then put the camera back in, uh, back in my bag as if she had, she had won. Did she say anything? To yeah, you oh, she like, yeah, she you got, you got to tell me where the, you got to tell me who they are, because I'm the police. <laughs> she actually said that. I, was, I, I wish I had my camera for that. She actually said it. And then she, and then she, did she tell you I'm gonna delete your footage if you don't talk, or did she just? Um, do it right she just did it. She, well, she tried to do it herself, and then called over you know some computer someone who's good at computers who works with the police to, to help her erase my camera <laughs> i did i wasn't sure she had erased it until after i got out but once when i opened i saw that was erased I, I wasn't surprised it was kind of disheartening because i didn't immediately think forensic recovery and then um as soon as as soon as that thought crossed uh, crossed our mind we ran through the software tools and got it right back but, so even though the cops didn't leave my footage uh, i was able to get it back and i could show you guys how to do it so if it happens to you you could you could get your footage back later on. What happened to uh, the police officer uh, that arrested you? Uh, the officer who arrested me, uh, Detective Richard Anastasi from the Miami Beach Police Department, um, had a long internal affairs rap sheet, uh, was shortly fired um, from the police department and an un due to an unrelated incident, but was then arrested by the FBI for kidnapping and extortion after he kidnapped a carter, and who turned out to be an FBI informant. Sounds like a crazy stuff. It's, it's stuff you can't make up. The articles, do, it's all documented. In, uh, the New Times did a great job documenting the whole story. And um, essentially, the uh, essentially, he for whatever reason was having carded merchandise sent to his house. And once he was hard up for cash after losing his detective gig, he kidnapped the drop guy who was picking up the bags from his house and said, uh, and had a, a friend of his who did forex scams hold a hundred grand up to uh, hold, hold an assault rifle to his head and demand a hundred grand uh, for uh, uh, to let him go and. He was a drop boy. They gave him 500 bucks and tortured him for the whole night and shook him down over the next three days. Turns out the drop boy was also an FBI, uh, FBI informant in an unrelated criminal case. So he's calling up his handlers, going, "What's you know? Is this part of the, is this part of being an informant for you guys?" And the FBI put a stop to that and arrested the guy one block from here where I was arrested. So your, your police officer that arrested you was arrested over there. Yeah, one block away. <laughs> They, they, because the, the FBI called him up and said, we've got your money. Come, you know, come meet us. We've got the hundred grand. He's like, all right, all right. And then as soon as he showed up, they arrested him. And he um, was going to face life, but he pled out to five and served two. So it goes to show if you use stolen credit cards, you could serve, you know, 20 years. But if you, uh, like Albert Gonzalez, who was also arrested in that hotel right there, um, the, he was, uh, uh, so if you, you'll get 20 years for that. And if you just kidnap someone from a carding ring, you'll only get two years. So, so we're Started off as, a, as an exercise and just the First Amendment and journalism ended up taking us on a whole thing where I ended up learning how to do forensic recovery, was able to sort of build a career around it and then simultaneously watch the, the cops who broke the law and took me in, uh, watch them get arrested for kidnapping people who are also related to the same hacking industry I was in and it was pretty hilarious. At, at the end of the day, I, I, I could say LOL. Well, that's Alex. He's really good spirited about it, and uh, interesting. The uh, the charges were dropped very very uh, shortly after he was arrested, but he was detained uh, for a while that night. And uh, I actually still have I still have the physical camera it's sitting about three feet from me on my other desk uh, from that night. And uh, you the the footage you heard of the cursing and and the swearing about a minute and a half in those were all that was the cops that was right after they tackled him and he was on the ground and you heard them. Is this federaljack.com? It, it, it is. It's federaljack.com. So, yeah, tell me again they don't go after people filming them. And they don't try it. They don't want people seeing what they're doing. And this was years ago. This was before it was uh, in style and in vogue with the cops to beat the crap out of you for videotaping them. Which, which actually happens quite often now. But, yeah. So there you go. My boy Alex from Federal Jack. We'll be right back. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back. So, yeah, that was Alex, and there are a few of us. I, you often hear me say, uh, you, or if you go to Federal Jack, I, you'll hear me say when I refer to Federal Jack, we, but if you go to Federal Jack, you'll notice that 99.9% .9 of the posts are posted by me. That's because I'm the webmaster, and I do the graphics and stuff, and I've, I actually have had some uh, outside help with uh, graphics here and there, uh, people that are listeners have done graphics for me here and there, and I'm greatly appreciated to them. 
uh, for uh, you know indebted to them, and I appreciate what they've done for me. Uh, but uh, I, I run the site uh, that you see, you know, posting wise and stuff like that. I, I kind of uh, the, you know the captain of the ship, as it were, uh, by myself. But the site would not run without Alex and my other friend James. That the two of them, if it weren't for those guys, and I want to give them some credit because often they're kept uh, kind of in the shadows, and they don't, uh, you know, they don't run around seeking recognition. And uh, uh, you know, we haven't uh, even still to this day when we, if we go out and we do live reporting, they'll come out and they'll meet me if we if we go out on the street and do something, and I need a hand, and you know, I need a street team or whatever, they'll meet me somewhere. So, uh, you know, it, I want to take a, just a minute or two and give them credit where credit is due because. They do bust their butts for the the network, and they're the guys that are responsible for the uh, security for the website, and they're the ones that deal with all the hack attacks that we get. So, big kudos to Alex and to James for all the work you guys do over on federaljack.com and keeping it secure so that you, ladies and gentlemen, the listener, can go to the Listen Live page. You guys can go to the, the download section that I built, all that stuff. If it weren't for them keeping it secure, you wouldn't be able to get to it because, believe me, we get attacked. And they do a lot of other stuff on the back end that if it weren't for them, you guys wouldn't even have Federal Jack. So I can't take all the credit myself. All right. I want to get into the craziness that's going on. The attack on conspiracy theorists. Because that's what it is. It's an attack on anybody that has conspiratorial type thinking. right? Even though you can go to court and get charged with conspiracy to commit murder or robbery or whatever else they want to charge you with conspiracy to do. If you think the government does it, then you're a mental patient. Now, you've seen this attack in the mainstream media, and I'm going to be debunking the morons over at MSNBC. But you've seen this attack in the mainstream media focusing on anybody that questions the government. If you think the government would do anything, and I'm actually surprised they're bringing up 9-11 as much as they are, but they are. And if you believe 9-11, then you... If you believe 9-11 was uh, not done by bin Laden, but done by the government or a faction thereof, uh, then uh, that means that instantaneously you believe the moon landings were faked and uh, this and that and the other thing. All the stuff, they, they try to mush it together. And then after a few days of that, they start to bring on the psychologists and they start to interview them in articles like Salon. Why do, why do conspiracy theorists think the way they do? Well, where is this going? Well, they're trying to form the narrative because I'll tell you where it's going. Palm Beach County, Florida. The Palm Beach County Sheriff gets $1 million for a violence prevention unit. Now, that, that sounds well and good, right? They're going to prevent violence, Popeye. How could that be bad? The violence prevention unit is going to be Police, psychiatrists, okay? They, they, they say mental health advocates, okay? But it's going to be a, a state-funded and run Gestapo consisting of police and doctors. Hmm, where have I seen this before? I, striking resemblance to something I know I've seen this somewhere before. Twice at least. There was somewhere in Russia... They called it the USSR at the time. That was that guy named Stalin, and there was another dude, a little German guy. He was a painter. Actually, he was Austrian. He had a, he had a little mustache. All of his officers and military guys were fancy, flashy dressers. I mean, I, does anybody see where I'm going with this? The Palm Beach County Sheriff is getting a million dollars... For this violence suppression unit, so that if you don't, and they say in the article, if you don't trust the government, you know, then call. We want to go check it out. And they'll come, they'll send cops out to your door at like 12 o'clock midnight. If you're, if you're out ranting, say you and your neighbor are talking and you guys are sitting having a drink on the patio and you say, oh, I don't like Obama. He goes inside and calls them. They'll come, to, if they think it's warranted, they'll come to your door that night for a sit down with you. Welcome to the new America with a K. We'll be right back. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. I saw a comment on one of the YouTube uploads of one of my uh, older broadcasts from, I don't know, a week or two ago, maybe two, three weeks ago, 
Uh, but the comment just came in recently. And the person said, why, why do people use the term down the rabbit hole when referring to this stuff? Alice wanted to get out of there. She didn't want to stay in Wonderland. Well, um, I don't want to stay in Wonderland either. You think I like the way things are? You think this is peachy to be talking about this all the time? No. Trust me, I could talk about a lot of other things. If you go back and listen to my archives, I've been on other shows where we didn't talk conspiracy or anything. We got to be a little more lighthearted for the evening and talk about other things. I actually do comedy pretty well, too. I'm a pretty funny dude. I don't like talking about this. I don't enjoy telling people how screwed up the world is or that they rape little kids or they, you know, they worship Minerva and Satan and Molech or Nimrod. They're all pretty much the same, everything. Going back to Babylonian deities and all this. Do you think I like telling people this type of thing? Do you think I like telling people that there's a secret organization behind everything? That, yes, there are really secret powers that shouldn't be and that they're manipulated? No, I don't. None of us do. And I call the show Down the Rabbit Hole. I've said this before. I titled it that because of Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass. And the only reason why I didn't call it Through the Looking Glass is I, don't, I, I wasn't sure if people nowadays would understand the term looking glass. And if that would just drive them away because they didn't quite understand it, which happens. So the term Down the Rabbit Hole okay, is pretty widely known. Everybody knows the story of Alice in Wonderland. And that's where we are. We are in Wonderland, Bizarro World. It is not my choice. I didn't choose to do this. I, I, <clears throat> I didn't conspire with the universe to, to bring me to where I am today. Maybe I did, uh, uh, you know, subconsciously. But I, I, I didn't conspire, with, you know, to, to make any of this up. Uh, to live in my own fantasy world. And nobody else does either. Believe me, I wish this stuff were fake. I wish it were all hyperbole and fiction, but it's not. It's unfortunately very, very real. And we have to deal with it. And the best way to deal with it is to admit that there's a problem and then move on through the problem and then hopefully come to a solution and being, be able to have that, that sought-after Ah, peace, right? That's the whole goal. Anyway, I don't want to get too sidetracked. So, Palm Beach Sheriff is going to get a million dollars for this crime prevention, violence prevention unit, they're calling it. And there's civil libertarians that are up in arms, but it, it got rushed through so it, to get funded. Now the only way it'll get stopped is if the governor vetoes it. So people are going to have to call up Rick Scott and see if uh, he'll... Uh, He'll veto funding for this because it's getting state funding, obviously. And they'll come knock on your door. We don't want to violate anybody's civil rights, but if you know they're if they don't trust the government and they're they say they're going to shoot the mayor, so right off the bat, if you don't trust the government, you're going to go shoot a politician. You're going to go kill somebody. Do you see how they go from point A to Z, and there's no stop in between? They connect – if you have – if you don't agree with everything that your politicians are doing – so if your politicians are openly raping kids, videotaping it, and putting it on the town video channel for everybody to see, do you, do you go along with that? Do you? If they were raping nuns and videotaping that, w would that be okay? I use, I use those extreme analogies because they are doing horrific things. We're just going to come and knock on your door. Just in case you don't like the government. Ladies and gentlemen, let me, let me explain something to you. When this stuff starts to happen, if you don't put your foot down and you don't nip it in the bud, this is going to come a bigger problem. Don't believe me? Look at history. Every other time you get totalitarian regimes 
they always start off just like this. Oh, we just just in case you don't trust the government, or you're talking about the, you know the, the 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 people that are in power now. Um, isn't that your First Amendment right to say I don't trust the government? Well, if you're going to threaten the president, well, no, but no one see what I mean. You're people, you're jumping to that extreme. Well, he doesn't like the government, so he that automatically means that that person wants to kill all the politicians that are ever out there, ever. All politicians are not safe around this person, so he should be locked up. Well, says who? Did the guy ever say he was going to kill anybody? Well, no, but he doesn't trust the government. He's got a bumper sticker that says, don't trust the government, or, uh, you know, don't steal. The government hates competition. Really? Really? So that's why they keep attacking people. Outside the box thinkers, conspiracy theorists, oh my god. That's why they're attacking them. Because they have to. They have to. It, it, not only is it, it a panic move because they're afraid of the independent slash alternative, whatever you want to call it, media, okay, kicking their rear ends because people are going elsewhere. They're not going to them anymore for news. So they're losing their power. They're losing their control. They're the only thing that they have power over. So that fuels them, and it's their job to attack, be little attack dogs. So that's all they're going to do. Now, I want to get into the attack on Ron Paul. And by the way, why would they do this? They would do this to frame up the argument that anybody that questions authority is crazy and needs to be rounded up. And again, this happened in Soviet Russia. This happened in Nazi Germany, and it's happened in many other dictatorial regimes. If you don't believe me, just go read. And I don't mean a book that was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation in any way, shape, or form. Go pick up a real history book somewhere that was written by somebody, that independent, whoever. There, there's plenty of stuff out there. And don't just watch a YouTube video, because that doesn't make you a warrior for truth because you saw a YouTube video either. Anyway, I want to start ripping apart Lawrence O'Donnell because he attacked Ron Paul for what? Well, Ron Paul brought up the fact that, hey, you know, what happened in Boston with them going door to door and everything is crazy and it's martial law and blah, blah, blah. Right? Ron Paul is a Mr. Anti-Government, right? Anti-establishment. They used to call him Dr. No. So now that he's out, now it's all bets are off. He's crazy, blah, 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 blah. Got to attack him. So first... O'Donnell, I didn't want to give him the, the full time of his stupid little segment here, but he uh, first thing he did was he set up his his little argument, and I'm going to start it now, and then we'll get into it in the, the, the final segment, and it might carry over into the beginning of the second hour, and then I'm going to uh, take the other MSNBC host to the woodshed that I want to tear apart. But Lawrence O'Donnell calls Ron Paul a liar because Ron Paul said that there were people being taken out of their houses at gunpoint in Boston. He says that he categorically says that did that did not happen at all, and that that's a lie. Really? I guess all those pictures all over the Internet are lies. Now, a lot of that stuff's disappearing. So, by the way, I urge all of you to go out and rip whatever videos you can, rip whatever pictures you can. People, it's important you back up stuff when you see it. Rip the videos. Rip the pictures. Do it. Trust me, it's, history is really worth the investment. All right, let's get into this attack on the anti-government Dr. Ron Paul. And the first thing he did, uh, he framed it by attacking Rand and, sh and, sh and showing how Rand had flip-flopped from uh, filibustering for drones, and then he had made a comment about somebody coming out of a liquor store getting droned, right? Uh, so he, he uses that to frame the argument that the Pauls are all liars, the whole family's a bunch of liars. So... It's a straw man argument filled with ad hominem attacks right off the bat. But I didn't want to waste two minutes of your time hearing him just sit there and bash Rand Paul. I mean, first of all, I, Rand's not, I'm not his biggest fan anyway, but it, it, it's all garbage anyway. So why waste your ears with it? Just understand, if you want to watch the video, you can. Uh, it's over on uh, Mox News, over on YouTube. Uh, just look up Ron Paul called a paranoid liar. Just Google that or whatever search engine you want to use because it's it's on YouTube. So if you used if you use the NSA uh, search engine there, it'll come up. But you'll see it again, titled "Ron Paul called a paranoid liar." 
and it's it's a complete straw man argument based off of right off the bat. He he uses a, like as a base for this. He uses ad hominem attacks. That's why he had to attack Rand first. He had to attack his credibility and show you how his son flip flops to then attack the father. Because if if the son did it, then the father does it. And we all know that they're two totally different people. But I digress. Here we go. Finally, gave the world his long-awaited take on law enforcement reaction to the bombing. In an op-ed for a libertarian website entitled, Liberty Was Also Attacked in Boston, Ron is a much more consistent libertarian than Rand, who is surely the slowest student of libertarianism in the Paul family. But Ron lies just as much as his son and just as blatantly and always has. The first word of Ron's op-ed piece is a lie. The first word, the first sentence is a lie. The first paragraph is a lie. Let's count the lies in Ron's first paragraph. Forced. Forced lockdown of a city. Now let's listen to the governor announcing the forced lockdown. We're asking people to shelter in place, in other words, to stay indoors with their doors locked and not to open the door for anyone other than a, a properly identified law enforcement officer. And that applies uh, here in Watertown, where we are right now. Also Cambridge, Waltham, Newton, Belmont, and at this point, all of Boston. All of Boston. Did you get that? Forced? He said, we're asking people to shelter in place. That's what the governor said. He did not order anyone to do anything. Now let's listen to the guy who stepped up to the microphone right after the governor. Uh, I, well, I got to ask you something, Lawrence. Um, what was happening to people that were just wandering around out on the streets? Hmm? Oh, that's right. They were getting stopped by the police. So was was life actually going on like normal? No, not at that moment. It wasn't. There's video footage where CNN and all these other news agencies are on the ground and the streets look like a ghost town. The Boston Police Commissioner. Mayor Menino has asked me to come here and to tell you that the shelter in place uh, recommendation has been extended throughout the city of Boston. The shelter in place recommendation. So forced is lie number one. Let's look at lie number That's not a lie. Their little terminology, shelter and recommendation, if they're recommending that you stay indoors, again, what happened to the people that didn't stay indoors? Go look at video footage from that period of time when they were, the whole city was in lockdown that day. Nothing was going on. There was a no-fly zone over the city. Oh, we'll get into that because we got a break coming up. You'll, we'll get into that. You'll hear him. Oh, that's a lie. Really? As the listener, I want you to write down what he's saying is a lie, and you can go research it for yourself. You'll hear me refute it, but go and research it for yourself. You'll see. complete fabrication what he's doing actually is he's projecting by by continuously saying that there's lies within like the first 10 seconds and blah 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 blah. that's what he's talking about himself he's just projecting that out onto ron paul we'll be right back all right ladies and gentlemen we are back we got about six minutes let's get back into it with this just complete logical fallacy filled uh, attack piece put together by MSNBC and mouthed out loud by Lawrence O'Donnell. And he was attacking Ron Paul for his reaction to the uh, martial law of Boston. And he was just talking about the, the forced lockdown of the city. And he's going to be getting into the milita militarized police. Here we go. Number two. Tanks. Okay. Okay. There were no tanks in Boston. The Boston police don't have tanks. You noticed he doesn't attack 
the term militarized police because that he knows he can't attack. What I mean, they're riding around with military style gear, doing military style maneuvers with the military, the National Guard. So you can't say they're not militarized. Ron Paul calls he called them their tanks, meaning the the black SWAT vehicles that they were using. I don't know if there were any MRAPs out there. There could have very well been. But there were Humvees and stuff out there. So, because he said, you know, tank, as in, like, armored personnel carrier, you know, armored vehicle, okay, which is what he meant, Lawrence O'Donnell's going to jump on it. And then the best part is, they show a picture of a Bradley fighting vehicle. If you really wanted to show... I mean... It technically, it it, it kind of is a tank, but it, it's really not. It's like a light tank. I mean, if that thing, if a Bradley and a, you know an M R Abrams went head to head in a battle, I'll give you one guess who would win. So it's I don't know really. Well, like it's that shredded vehicle and you know armored tread you know, whatever, but it's not really a, the appropriate picture that he should have used. He should have put up a picture of an M one Abrams. But I digress. So I just wanted to point out that. You know, one idiot trying to point out somebody's mistake, and they make their own mistake. This is a tank. And this is the most fearsome vehicle that the Boston police used in the manhunt. It's about as scary as the armored trucks that move cash to and from your neighborhood bank. Really? So the Brinks truck has a winch and battering ram capabilities and is bulletproof and has little slots where the cops could hide inside and shoot weapons out at you? Really? Really, Lawrence? You're going to compare a SWAT vehicle, an armored personnel carrier, to a Brinks truck? I know back in the day that's what the SWAT teams might have used, but things have progressed since 9-11, and you know that. It is not a tank. Look at those tires on the police vehicle. Now look at the tires on a tank. See? No tires on a tank. Ron Paul knows the difference. He served honorably in our military. He knows the difference between a tank and an armored car, but for rhetorical effect, he prefers the lie to the truth on that one. Door-to-door armed searches without warrant. Police don't need warrants if property owners welcome, welcome them into their homes. Families thrown out of their homes at gunpoint to be searched without probable cause. No guns were pointed at any families. Some that is an outright lie. You, sir, Lawrence O'Donnell, are a liar. If you were sitting right in front of me, I would tell you to your face, you are a bold-faced liar. He just told you no guns were pointed at anybody. Really? There's video of it. There's video of people that didn't want to leave their house, and they were getting yanked out of their house. Not everybody voluntarily walked out of their house, Lawrence. That's absolutely not true. And even the people that did walk out of their house and weren't yanked out physically you know, by the cops grabbing them with their hands, there's pictures of the cops with their guns drawn. With their guns drawn on these people. So you, sir, are a liar. You are a huge liar, and you know it. You just heard him outright lie to you, ladies and gentlemen. He just said to you that nobody was pulled out of their house at gunpoint. Are you that stupid? Are you? Because they think you are. I don't think you are, but they do. Google Martial Law Boston 2013. Look at the pictures that come up. Or go to start page or whatever search engine you want. I don't really care at this point. Just look it up. And while you're there, save the photos. And any video. 
Otherwise, we're going to have a problem. It'll disappear. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to break. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back with hour number two. I'll finish up debunking Lawrence's crappy lies, and then we'll get into the other MSNBC mouthpiece. We'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back with hour number two here on tonight's live edition of Down the Rabbit Hole. I am your host, Popeye from FederalJack.com. It is May 2nd, 2013. One more day until Friday. Woohoo! Been a long week. It's been a long year already. Although it did go by rather fast. I said this the other day. Uh, it was the end of April. Now it's the beginning of May already. I mean, whew, time seems to be speeding up. I think actually Joe has Brooks Agnew coming on his show about that. Something about time and speeding of time or disappearing of time. I don't know. I didn't hear it, but I know Brooks Agnew is coming on. Wherever he comes on, I like to plug in. So I'll give Joe a plug for his broadcast. I'm not sure exactly when. Coming up within the next, I think it's either tomorrow. I think it is tomorrow. Check out Joe's show tomorrow. I think it's either tomorrow or sometime next week. He's got Brooks Agnew coming on. He's getting into that and a few other things. Anyway, I want to get back into... I'm going to wait till the other segment, though, because... Uh, that the beginning segment's always short and quick. And I want to get back into Lawrence O'Donnell. I'm going to call him Liar Lawrence. Lying Larry. Well, I, uh, you, Silverstein's already got that. I guess we could call him Lawrence. Lawrence of Liars. Like Lawrence of Arabia, but Lawrence of Liars. There you go. Or Lying Lawrence, whatever you want to call him. You know, you got to go over and check out We Are Change's YouTube channel because Luke just interviewed him. He got him on the street, and you should hear how he kisses his rear end. Not Luke. Lawrence kisses Luke's butt. Oh, you know, I, you know, there's a need for what you guys do, and you know, blah 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 blah. You should hear him. Oh, my, my nephew watches your videos, and we, I was having dinner with him the other day, and he was telling me about the stuff that you've done, and he's, he's seen our prior interactions. Just like trying to have witty banter with Luke, trying to, you know, keep him off guard. But you could see there was really, there was, there, where was the same attitude of, oh, we are change our terrorists. They think 9-11 was an inside job. You're a terrorist. You need to be locked up. You're crazy. Because that's what this whole thing is about. That's what they're trying to set. That's the whole frame. They're tr that's the argument that they're trying to frame for you. Is that if you think outside the box, you are now conspiracy-oriented, you're nuts, and you need medical help. And you can't have any guns, and you, 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 you just need to be locked up and taken away from society. You shouldn't have access to the Internet. Because after all, it's outside the box thinkers' fault that bad things happen. So lock them up and then all bad things will stop, right? And then when the bad things don't stop, then who are they going to lock up? The only people that are left. That's who. Hmm. Again, I've seen this happen somewhere before. Hmm. First it was started with the media, where the media laid the groundwork. Hmm. Where have I seen this kind of stuff before? Propaganda being put out, and then people being demonized, and then rounded up, and put in prison camps. I, I know I've seen this somewhere before. Recently. You know, within the past hundred years. Hmm. Oh, well, that's right, World War II. And that whole time period. We'll be right back. All right, we are back, ladies and gentlemen. Let's get back into lying Lawrence's attack on Ron Paul and his response to martial law. And then I want to get into Martin Bushir of MSNBC. So first, let's let Lawrence put his foot in his mouth. Again, he was telling you all, in case you don't know where we left off, that there was no guns being pointed at anybody when they were getting taken out of their houses. And at no point was anybody removed from their houses at gunpoint in Boston. I mean, we all know that's a lie, but that's what he wants you to believe because he thinks you're that stupid. 
Some families vacated their homes in Cambridge as police searched homes in that area, in the, sus in the area of the suspect's home. I was on the street in Cambridge then talking to the residents who were very glad to be out of their homes for the few hours it took the police to be sure that there were no more bombs in that area near the suspect's home, in or near the suspect's home. The street that the police was searching then was actually full of spectators and reporters watching the bomb search from what we hoped was a safe distance. None of the spectators on the street were following the recommendation to shelter in place and no police officer told them to go home because no police officer had the authority to tell anyone to go home because there was no forced lockdown. The best part is, like, 96% of the city had to have been indoors, okay? Every time you see the videos, it's it's also a creative way of shooting, you know, certain camera angles. But you see them panning back and forth, and there's, there. I mean, there's there are some people in some of the shots, but not the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and possible thousands of people that he, you know, acts like are standing there. In fact, in some of the shots, you look around, the city looks dead. You can see something happened. But, yeah, they, they, you know, they, don't worry about the no, there, there was a no-fly zone. That was admitted. Yeah, that didn't happen. That's a lie. He's making that up, too. Right, Lawrence? No businesses were forced to close. That is another Ron Paul lie. No businesses were forced to close. A wonderful little cafe was doing a busy lunch business on the corner of the street being searched for bombs in Cambridge. Transport shut down. Well, taxis were running most of the day and you could always drive a car anywhere you wanted, but subways and buses were shut down. So I will give Ron Paul that one. Uh, and by the way, cops do need a warrant to search your house. Uh, and yeah, you could say, well, if, if the people voluntarily let them search the house, but they didn't voluntarily let them search the house. They walked up with guns drawn and said to them, get out of your house. And then they were searching your house. And then they went in and they searched their houses. That's what happened. The people weren't out there going, excuse me, you... Yes, you, the one that's dressed like a stormtrooper. Yes, you. Could you please come in my house and violate my civil rights? Please. Please come in. V my civil liberties? Throw them right out the window. Pfft. I don't need freedom. Please come in. Please. And while you're here, could you give me a prostate exam? The terrorist might be hiding inside my colon. There might have been one or two people. There might have been some of the Stockholm Syndrome people out there, but go look at the video. Go look at the pictures. You're a liar. Cops didn't go up and knock on the door. Excuse me, do you mind if we come in and search your house, ma'am? We just want to make sure. That's not what happened, you liar. You're an absolute liar. Lying Lawrence. So the first paragraph has six sentences and five lies. Ron Paul repeats variations on those lies throughout the piece. The shelter in place command. Those are his words. That's what he calls it. There was no command. The paramilitary troops terrorizing the public. That, those are the words he used. Terrorizing the public. Here... Now again, what he'll do is he, he makes a straight... He turns that into a straw man. He attacks the... He makes a straw man argument of this and attacks it. He doesn't, again, address the term paramilitary or militarized police. He instead attacks the part where he says, terrorizing the public, and he shows the, what, I don't know, 50 people at the most, maybe 60 people that, were, that they show in the video. USA! USA! I didn't see the entire city of Boston out there in the streets cheering. It was this small group of people, and they flashed. He flashes to that video, and then he just continues his attack on him and frames it that he's crazy and you know these constitutionalists, you know. This, and then he he actually apologizes to the Libertarian Party and says, oh, "I'm sorry, this is who represents you," and blah 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 blah. 
It's it's ridiculous. If you understand, first of all, if you saw what happened with your own two eyes, you saw it with your own two eyes. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to, holy crap, that really just happened. Lawrence is telling you that it didn't happen. He's telling you you got lying eyes. And he actually believes that you're stupid enough that you'll believe it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I don't believe you're stupid enough. Hence why I come on air and I point this stuff out to you and say, hey, look at that. This guy thinks you're a moron. How does that make you feel? Doesn't that piss you off that these people don't even have the slightest bit of respect for your intelligence at all? That they think you're so damn stupid that they can just tell you whatever that they want and that you'll buy it. And there are a, there are there is I should say a large uh, portion of the United States that do still buy into the mainstream media, but they are failing, and that's why you see these attacks on conspiracy theorists or the independent media. Now, with that in mind, I'm going to bring up Martin Bushir. And his little attack. Now he, again, he, he lumps Jones, Glenn Beck, and Fox News and Drudge all together. And tries to make it that all these conspiracies, uh, like when he attacks Jones, he, he makes it about him. It's about Alex. When he talks about Beck, it's about Glenn. It's all about all of these guys, about them. It's a logical fallacy. He's making the argument about that. It's an ad hominem attack. He's taking your eyes off the ball. He's taking your eyes off of the main argument, right? And what the what what the people have said. Whether or not you agree with Glenn Beck, I think he's a douche. But whether or not you agree with him, okay, he at least came out publicly against this. Whether or not you agree with Alex Jones, I don't agree with everything Alex does or says, okay. What it, 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 it doesn't whether or not you agree with him really does not matter. Okay, if you think the same way at all, conspiratorially, right, you're being lumped into this. You're being attacked as well. Okay, and what they do is they the they make the ad hominem is they make it about the person. So they attack Jones because they know that there's a certain segment of people out there that don't like Alex, whether or not they're in the, the alternative media or not. Right, so that and a lot of people will jump on that, and it, it becomes you know in chat rooms and message boards, and people go back and forth, and it ends up be wasting people's time, which is what it's meant to do. That's what all of this is meant to do. It's meant to keep you distracted from the fact that they don't have a valid argument to begin with. There is no good reason to have martial law in the streets at all in this country ever, 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 ever. If you have an armed citizenry who knows what's going on and is aware and awake, you're good to go. But they don't want that because then they can't take over. You understand what's going on? Okay, anyway, let's get into it. And he starts off, their, uh, he starts off the attack by playing clips from uh, Glenn Beck and uh, Fox News, and then he gets into attacking Jones. Here we go. Female DNA found on one of the bombs. Could it be the widow of Tamerlan? Just one other uh, note regarding the female de DNA. They say it could actually be just a hair. There was a lot of hair that day. It is a frightening looking picture. When I was over in Auschwitz, as I was trying to figure out exactly how did this happen, you weren't allowed to look outside. If you came to the window, they killed you and your whole family. Oh, there's no way that any of this is going to happen in America. Whatever, you can live in your little dream world. Your boy said this was a false flag. What you say is dangerous. I'm sure everybody here loves to hear that the FBI blew up the Boston Marathon. We got the photos of We got the photos of You got You got Jack What you just saw there was a Cambridge, Massachusetts native attacking one of the reporters, and I use the term loosely, for InfoWars. That is the site. Well, uh, first of all, uh, and I'm not, you can bash whoever you want, Martin, InfoWars and Dan Badandi and Jones and his crew. They're, they're big enough boys. They could take you on and spank you by themselves. They really don't need my help. But right off the bat, it's an ad hominem attack. I use that term loosely. Okay, Mr. Snarky, I should use the term loosely to you. Didn't you admit last year in 2012 that you lied in this, uh, what was it, a documentary you did, Living with Michael Jackson? And you, you fabricated a bunch of whatever it was, stories, or I, I, I can't remember the exact details of it right off the bat, but you go look it up, ladies and gentlemen, you'll see. So you're, gonna, you, you're an admitted liar, sir. You came on air and admitted that you lied. And right off the bat, you start off this attack with, well, you know, I, I use the term loosely. And that whole, that guy that went after Badandi, by the way, 
That thing reeks. It reeks. Agent provocateurish type crap. Especially if you see the video when you see the, the, how cocky the guy is. And, and you'll, Bushir interviews him. You'll hear him. And he only has him on for a brief period of time. And then he goes to his, he goes to his, uh, his panel of experts. Here we go. Run by talk radio host Alex Jones, who, among other conspiracy theories, supports the idea that the government may have been behind the Boston Marathon bombings. And we'd like to welcome the individual who made that tape. He is Roger Nicholson. Good afternoon, Roger. Hey, how are you? What was it about this reporter that sparked such anger? Why did you decide to give him such a piece of your mind? Well, uh, I had been hearing him hijacking uh, these news. Uh, the, the governor, Deval Patrick, was making press conferences, and he kept hijacking them with these questions. And uh, I had a dear friend of mine who was at the at the marathon when the bomb went off. She was about 20 feet away. Her name's Tracy Monroe. Do you, you see how one of the things I say, this guy's shady? Do you see what he just said? He never said he saw Dan Badandi. He said, I heard him hijacking these press conferences. Well, then how did you know who to go up to on the street and attack, sir, if you only heard him? Because they didn't cut to Dan when he was talking. Of course, the, the cameras would always you know, stay on either the person that was be having the question asked, the official, or it would, you know, do like a, a, it would you know, pull back and give a wider shot. But you really wouldn't see Dan asking the questions. So unless the guy went and watched the InfoWars videos that were put out there and went to the alternative media and then confronted him, but that's kind of trollish, agent, provocateurish behavior. And then when he comes on, Martin Bouchier does not have the guy you know, give any factual evidence dispute it. How do you know that the FBI didn't do that? Oh, because they wouldn't do that. The FBI would never do that. But they have done it already. They've, they've actually done it. The 1993 World Trade Center bombing, amongst others. So, yeah, they already set a precedent. They've done it. How dare you? Why? Why, why is it wrong for him to ask that question? Why? He's just asking a question. He didn't go up and rape a kitty cat on live television, did he? Nope. He didn't punch a nun in the face or run over a busload of school children with a monster truck. He asked a simple question. That's all he did was ask a simple question. And yet he's being attacked. And how do they attack it? Appeal to emotion. Well, my friend was there and she was injured. Well, how many people did they say were injured now? Up to 270? Do you know all the names? And I, don't, I don't know if that number is accurate. I mean, the number keeps rising every day. But, uh, well, well, even if it was 100 and, we'll say 172, I think, was the one at one point, the count. So we'll say, 100, say 172 people were injured, right? Do you know the names of every injured person out there? Hmm? Do you have every injured person's name on a list? Personally, you? So how do you know who this guy is and who his friend is he's throwing names out there open your eyes we'll be right back ladies and gentlemen we are back i knew it was too good to be true i just knew it was too good to be true when i read that article in the beginning and for some reason i knew the i i knew that the the website was satirical but i didn't have the i, I had the website open but I have a few things printed out in front of me so I could, you know, little notes written on them. And I didn't even realize it. I don't know why it didn't click into my head, but it was satire. I see, I knew it was too damn funny and too damn awesome to be true. So, yes, I'm disheartened to find out <laughs> that that damn pizzeria story wasn't true. It was just, it was just satire. Ugh, too bad, right? But it is what it is. It happens. And uh, when I, because I saw a comment, somebody said, well, it, somebody had uh, commented uh, to me, I don't remember if it was on Facebook or uh, Twitter, and they said, uh, it, they're, it's a satire site. And I was like, wait a minute, I think they're right. So, because I was like, you know, I'm looking at the piece, the piece of paper. So I said, let me go to the 
tab and I open the tab and I look at it and I'm like, oh, I did get bit. So, yeah, I did. I got bit. It's a satire piece. Damn it. I was hoping it was true. I was hoping that was a real pizzeria. I would have given the guy uh <laughs> I would have given the guy a a a uh a free plug for like a month on the website. I would have given him a banner or something. I would have even gone out of my way to make him something if he had a website. But, oh well. Wishing, right? <laughs> well, if Bloomberg ever does come into your place. See, you know, now that I think about it, I was like, how did he, how did he not get assaulted by Bloomberg security goons? And if he really did that, wouldn't he be worried about Bloomberg sicking uh, the health department or, or other people at him? So, damn it. Oh, well. If, any, if he ever does come into your establishment, though, that is a good way. It, it, it does serve as an example of how we need to deal with people like that. So even though it was satire, it still serves as an example. It does. It serves as an example of what we should do when these scumbags tell us what to do. We shouldn't just sit here and buy into it. And I should pay more. I should pay closer attention when I print my articles out. That, was, that one was my fault. Every once in a while, you get bit. What are you going to do? But uh, damn it. I'm actually more pissed that it's not true because I was hoping somebody had the balls in New York to stand up to that tyrannical putz. I really wish somebody would do something like that and tell them, no, you only have a one slice limit. That would be awesome. I'm kind of upset that it's not true now. <laughs> I really am. pisses me off. It would have been nice to, to see if uh, somebody actually stood up to him and said, no, we've had enough of your crap. Perhaps, actually, if more people started doing that when these people came into their establishments and stopped treating them as if they were uh, royalty, we would be better off. Because we buy into that whole, you know, oh my God, it's Mayor Bloomberg, or oh my God, it's so-and-so. You know, when Obama or Biden, they go to eat a cheeseburger out in D.C. somewhere. I mean, it's, uh, it's so contrived. It's such a Photoshop or a photo... Uh, what do you call it? Photo op. It's, uh, well, they probably Photoshop stuff too, but it's just, it's disgusting. They used, oh, I'm an everyday person. I eat a hamburger at Joe's Hamburger Joint. It'd be great if somebody, if the politician walked in, like if Bloomberg walked into someone's joint and someone said, no, dude, I'm not going to serve you. You're scum. Get out. I mean, you can do that. Well, he's a, he's a tyrant. Well, you could stand up to him. I mean, if more people stood up to him, if everybody stood up, then there wouldn't be a problem, right? He wouldn't have that power. The only reason why any of these guys have any of the power that they do anyway is because they thrive off of your fear of them and what they're going to do to you or what they'll have their little henchmen do to you. It's like, you know, North Miami Beach, Florida, they used to have a mayor back in the day. And this guy was a little tyrant, and he would send his code enforcement people out, and the, he would have the he would complain to the cops, and you know, have them report people to the cops, and have the cops go out and harass people, and he would literally have the code enforcement people go out and write violations, and he would drive around in his van with his binoculars and look at people's houses and write down information. So, I mean, that's that that stuff happens. You know what happened? The residents stood up to him. The residents got tired of his little tyrannical attitude. You know what? They voted him out. They got rid of him. And they put in a mayor that they liked. Well, I don't know why you people want Mike Bloomberg, but whatever. <sighs> I just wish the story wasn't satire. Because <laughs> that would have been great for somebody to tell him to go get your own slice of pizza somewhere else. Damn it! Wish it wasn't satire. But what are you going to do? Oh well. Alright. We're going to break. We come back, I'll get back into tearing apart Martin Bouchier. Don't go anywhere. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back. I'm going to get into Martin Bouchier and their MSNBC's attack on quote-unquote conspiracy theorists. And as you heard, he was attacking, he had uh, the, uh, uh, the guy who supposedly lives in the area there who confronted Badani. Now, I don't know, I thought I saw that InfoWars either interviewed him yesterday or they were going to interview him today, and I I have not checked. I'll have to look into it and see if they have, because I would love to see if they were able to tear this guy apart as a, uh, a complete agent provocateur. But, by the way, uh, I'm glad that... I'm kind of glad that I, I got bit by that, and according to uh, 
one of the listeners they they messaged me they said that actually um that website what is it called the daily current or whatever uh people i guess go because their popularity they're high up in the 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 article like the search listings when people look stuff up and um uh, apparently other media outlets have gotten bit by them too but it doesn't matter i should have known better but the point is uh, I'm glad that it kind of. I'm, well, I'm kind of glad it happened because it serves as a, a point for me to show all of you that I'm just as fallible as anybody else out there. So I can make mistakes here or there. I'm none of us are superheroes, okay? None of us. We're all equal. Sometimes I make mistakes, but it's how you deal with said mistake, whether or not you own up to it or you try to cover your rear end and try to lie. And there was no point in me coming on air and going, well, you know, I knew it was satire because that wouldn't have been true. So I just wanted to make sure. It, it serves as a learning example for everybody. So there you go. See, I told you, don't don't put me up on a pedestal, anyone whatsoever. Uh, I'm just like you. I'm not above any of you. We're all equal, and I make mistakes from time to time. But I promise you, if I do make a mistake and I come across the fact that I did make a mistake, then I will uh, address it. ASAP, and I'm glad I was actually able to address it before the show was over, and I didn't learn about it, you know, five minutes after I got off air. That really would have pissed me off. <laughs> anyway, I want to get back into this just uh, total attack hit piece by a man, again, who admitted that he's lied. He's admitted that he outright lied doing quote-unquote journalism in the past. So really, can you trust anything that this man says to you? I doubt it. She uh, ran at first and then saw a young girl with her leg blown off and ran to help her. And, uh, and I was very affected by her, what she had experienced, and by the people. Did who you hear what he just said? By the way, this is the, the guy that attacked Badandi. And as I said when, we first, when I stopped the clip earlier, they're framing the argument based on appeal to emotion. Did you hear what he just said, though? Again, another, uh, another red flag. She was hurt in the explosion, but then got up and ran and saw a woman with missing a leg and that like had a, a part of her leg blown off and he uses the blown off very you know didn't you, you notice if you, if you listen to how he's talking and you watch um testimony from people that witnessed it or family members and stuff they're a lot more sensitive to how they speak this guy is speaking like he's rehearsed this i don't know I don't know if it's his body language alone or just the fact that I just don't trust the guy. He's very cocky. His story smells. But this is the guy that they're trying to set the tone with. Appeal to emotion. His friend was injured and he's pissed off. So he took on this scumbag InfoWars reporter. Rawr! You know, we're at the marathon, and I felt very—I just felt very angry that Infowars came to my town to start making uh, show material, creating show material over this tragedy of people that were affected, and uh, it offended me. Yeah, because Infowars is the only website and the only uh, alternative outlet, independent outlet, that went and covered this and said that things stunk and nothing was right and this, that, the other thing, right? It was, it was, it's all them make the argument about them. That way they're marginalized. They're, it's all their fault. You attack them, and that's it. The information that they've tried to get out is never, ever discussed. The guys in the khaki pants with the backpacks never, that looked like mercenaries, you know, private contractors as they're called nowadays, never discussed. Never. It's all appeal to emotion. I got pissed off that InfoWars came to my town. I got very, I felt very angry. I felt very angry. Appeal to emotion. He wants you, and the people putting this whole hit piece together, want you to have appeal to emotion. They want you to have anger towards Infowars and Badandi and Jones and Drudge and the rest of us that question and ask things and say, hey, this doesn't smell right. You have to understand what they're doing. Once you do, you can see right through it. It obviously did offend you uh, because you uh, launched a series of expletives against this individual. You were clearly very, very angry and annoyed. Yeah, well, I've seen these Infowar people on and off, and I kind of have been ignoring them doing a good job doing that. And 
Uh, to me, the Infowars, uh, the, the, whatever that show is, is, has become the Westboro Baptist Church of Journalism, and uh, I think these people are un-American and un- Another talking point. The other day, when I was showing and tearing apart the hit pieces, the one that Maddow did, she brought up the Westboro Baptist Church. Remember? It was a long piece. Covered the whole show. During the broadcast, it was either her or somebody on the broadcast brought up the Westboro Baptist Church and threw them in there. Oh, in fact, it was her guest, if I remember correctly. The Mark Bingham's mother. That's right. She said that they showed up to a 9-11 event the Westboro Baptist Church did one year. And she compared them, the guest, compared the Westboro Baptist Church to 9-11, quote-unquote, conspiracy theorists. What did this guest on the very same network, MSNBC, just do? What did you just hear him do? Same talking point. Hmm... Something smells fishy. Patriotic and uh, they're hysterics and uh, they're, they're not helping this country unify. Right. Your community has obviously been through an enormous amount of pain. They're not helping this country unify. It's all their fault for asking any sort of question. You should just shut your mouth and rally around the government mindlessly. Kind of like people did on 9-11, right? you yourself have uh, you speak of your personal friend tending to somebody who a child who was severely injured is there anything you yourself would like to say to mr. Jones obviously within the parameters of decency of course I know everyone's worried about me slipping and saying something untoward but uh, Alex Jones is uh, he's the David Koresh of uh, broadcasting he's he's uh, I, I don't you know I can't even get into it I just don't so now, look, I, you know what, I, I, I can't even get into it. I, I, I don't want to I, I get too flustered. It's so fake if you watch the video. It's so contrived. But first, he did what he set out to do. Alex Jones is David Koresh. David Koresh ran supposedly a cult, right? That's why they had to go in. And he killed police in Waco. And now if you actually go do a little research about the real story of Waco and what happened to those people, you'll have a better understanding of what went down. But the general public hears David Koresh, the uneducated, the people that are fed the crap, right? They hear David Koresh and they go, oh, isn't that the guy from Waco? And now this guy, again, a guest, talking point, Alex Jones is David Koresh. This guy, this whole thing is fake. This guy is, I'm telling you, agent provocateur, he, it, it, this guy is not real. I wouldn't believe it for, I don't care, it, you, you, could, you could show me his friend that got injured, I wouldn't believe it. This guy, I'm, no, he reeks. He's, and if he is really somebody that, uh, if he's not an agent provocateur, if he is really somebody, uh, the, the person that he says he is, uh, then he's being fed the very same lines that Maddow's guest was. Again, talking points. And if you look, yeah, when you watch the video, like I said, when Maddow's guest was talking, she kept looking over. That when she was talking about her son, and she, it was an honest, you, you could tell the difference when she was being honest, because she was looking right at the camera, and she was very animated. When she was reading talking points that you could see that they had laid out for her, she was looking off to her right, and she was sitting kind of less motion, uh, um, not motionless, but... Uh, not as not as animated. She was sitting still a little bit more, moving around a lot less. You have to you go watch the video. All the, the videos are available um, up at uh, Mox News over at um, YouTube, or just go to moxnews.com. I'm sure he's got the links and stuff there. But uh, it was from what, like a week ago, two weeks ago. You can go read, uh, you go listen, watch the video, and watch the whole thing through. I know Rachel Maddow's hard to stomach, but it's like a 20-minute video. Just watch it. Or fast forward to the end when the mother is on, the 9-11, Mark Bingham's mother, the 9-11 victim's mother, right? Go watch that part and watch when she's talking. As she, when she's talking about her son and anything that she remembers as a memory, it's easy to remember a memory. So it's very animated. Like my mother told me when I was a kid, this is something that stuck with me. My mother always said to me, 
it's easier to remember the truth than a lie, because the truth is the truth that's burned into your memory. A lie didn't happen. And although you made it up at the time, down the road you're going to forget the details of it, but the person you told the lie to, it was a real experience between the two of them, and it was burned in their memory forever. And when you forget things, that's how people get caught in lies. Right? Well, if you use that as a basic premise and you see how some of these guests, when they come on and they talk, you'll see how... Uh, it, and this is just an example, but like with his mother, you'll see when she's talking about her son, it's something that she remembers. It's the truth. And she's very animated. But when she's saying certain talking points, like the Westboro Baptist Church thing, and she re she remembered that part. Okay, that that you could see was that you could see that uh, she remembered the uh, the story of the 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 nine eleven victims memorial and things like that. But she was kind of looking off to the side. But during certain talking points that she was making, you'll see she's looking off to the side, looking off to the side. When she's talking about things that she can remember physically, she's more animated. So it's just a way of spotting whether or not someone's telling the truth. This guy seems like he's reciting something that he rehearsed before he came on Bushir's show. He just seems like an agent provocateur. I don't want those people in my neighborhood. I don't want them coming around my community. Our Cambridge, Massachusetts is one of the greatest places in the world. Uh, I have friends from all over the world, from all kinds of cultures, and I really like the diversity, and, and I, I appreciate what we have. I think Cambridge is doing it right. With the so you don't want people that are expressing freedom of speech? No, we, I don't want those people around my, me or my community. Mm. And this is reporting, Martin. This is what you consider reporting. Again, this is not reporting, ladies and gentlemen, at all. At all. Community, and I don't like seeing uh, people trying to come into our community and, and, and make some kind of sh sensational show about uh, something such as uh, a conspiracy theory that the FBI blew up the marathon. It is a risible theory. Roger Nicholson, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And for analysis, we bring in Ryan Grimm, Washington Bureau Chief of the Huffington Post, and Jonathan Alter, a columnist for the Bloomberg View, whose new book is The Center Holds, Obama and His Enemies. John, Matt Drudge has called this the year of Alex Jones, calling his radio show one hell of a broadcast. And for those unaware of Mr. Jones's theories, uh, here's the man explaining the events of the Boston bombing. I have never seen a false flag, provocateur, staged event uh, by a government come apart faster than it is right now. John, what do you say to that? Well, you know, honestly, uh, the idea that anybody would be giving this a guy who's just seeking more publicity for his show, trying to expand his far right wing empire, any more attention. We've had trash, lies, slurs in this country for a long time, but what's sickening to me about this is that there are a lot of people still in the hospital you know, who have limbs that are all. Appeal to emotion, and he did not answer the question. He didn't even answer anything to what Alex mentioned, right? You see how they play the game? It's appeal to emotion. It's disgusting to think like that. There's people in the hospital. Ugh. I'm not going to give Martin Bouchier any more airtime because I don't have to. I've already exposed the major red flags and hypocrisy of his little piece, right? I mean, you can go watch the rest of it and you'll see the rest of it. Uh, go over to Mox News on YouTube and you'll see his channel's great. He's got a ton of stuff he uploads there daily. And all, all, all like the videos when you hear me play um, the stuff from MSNBC or uh, Fox or CNN and you hear me rip it apart, a lot of times I, I get stuff from him sometimes i can get it right from the source but he usually has uh you know they'll they'll put up a small snippet uh and he'll put up the whole thing so you get the whole thing and a lot of times they just try to take things out of context so i want to give him a shout out and some uh, uh props for what he does because you know he spends a lot of time doing that channel and uh, you can go watch the videos in full over there but when you watch them you'll see uh, you know if you can stomach listening to it you'll see the crap it's put together to frame the argument so that way later on they can be, do things like what you see Palm Beach Sheriff 
What do you see them doing? Oh, well, we want to know if people don't like the government. What biz first of all, what business of it is yours if someone doesn't like the government? Well, I need we need to know that stuff. Why? That's someone's personal views. You're demonizing people for their personal views. Well, they could be dangerous. You don't understand. Oh, I I do understand. They could be dangerous. Well, so could anything. Cleanser could be dangerous if your kid eats it. Does that mean like cleanser needs to be locked up off the shelves now and nobody can go get it? If you go to uh, whatever your local food store is, you're not going to be allowed to buy uh, cleanser or anything like that? They're going to lock it up behind the counter like they do everything else now? What about buses? You put your kid on a school bus, you're so worried about your kid's safety. There's no school, there's no seatbelts on a school bus. Hmm? I mean, this is just ridiculous. You can't be kept safe from every little bad thing. And every time something bad happens, the politicians are going to continue to use it to tell you that you need them to keep you safe. How are your politicians keeping you safe from terrorists? How? Tell me how. How? How is Bloomberg keeping you safe from terrorists? Hmm? How is Obama keeping you safe from terrorists? They're not. Actually, their actions put people more at risk because the DHS is too busy focused on people here inside the United States. There are people out there that are pissed off at us and they genuinely don't like us because of, you know, I don't know, the past 10, 12 years. And even going back further than that, but especially the past 10 or 12 years, we've pissed off a lot of people around the world. So, yeah. I'm sure there is uh, one or two people here and there that want to kill American citizens, right? Wouldn't surprise me. And if we're too busy paying attention to threats that don't exist, what happens if there is a real one? Now, who bears the burden for that? Again, if this wasn't a contrived event, and it doesn't mean that the Obama administration pulled it off. It could be a neocon faction, as some people have postulated. Right? could be a faction of the neocons. They could be working in conjunction with the Obama administration behind the scenes. I mean, there's, there is infighting, too. Right? But that doesn't mean it wouldn't be considered a black op or a false flag operation. doesn't mean that those said people couldn't be certain people inside certain positions of power in the government because it pushes their agenda further. This stuff is real. It happens. I know it's scary. I know it's nasty. I know you don't want to think about it, but it is real, and it's what happens. It's time to man up. Everybody put their big boy pants on and realize that there are no unicorns and rainbows and... Uh, we need well. There are rainbows, but there are no unicorns that fart rainbows. That's the expression I use. We need to wake up and we need to smell the coffee. As soon as we start acknowledging that these problems exist, we can get through it. It's like anything else, right? If you have an issue with something, uh, if you know someone that has an issue drinking, right, and you want them to quit drinking, you want them to seek help. Well, the first step in them seeking help and getting through their problem is admitting there is a problem, right? Well, same thing as a country. The first step to getting through this whole vast problem that is the dark new world order is admitting that there is this vast conspiracy going on and that these people do do things. Once we admit that, that's the biggest step. Everything else starts to flow like dominoes falling or water over a waterfall. You just got to take that initial step. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are out of time. I'll catch you all again tomorrow night, live, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is Sparta! Don't go anywhere. Don't tune out. Because the entire schedule of shows rebroads throughout the night into the morning and into the afternoon. So stay tuned here at Unbound Radio, unboundradio.com. I love you all. 
I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs>